Welcome to class. Today, we will talk about spawn generation and growing wine cap mushroom. This week, we will make our own spawn. Remember, you don't have to do this. You can always buy it from a mushroom supply house. You will probably need to order it many weeks ahead of time, so you need to plan accordingly. Eventually, you will want to expand your skill and grow your own spawn, or you might want to grow some interesting mushroom you find growing on the wood, in the forest, or in your backyard. So in spawn production process, the mycelium from a mushroom culture is placed onto steam sterilized grain, and in time the mycelium completely grow through the grain. The grain slash mycelium mixture is called spawn, and the spawn is used to seed mushroom substrate. As you can see right here, this is from our class, you can see um, you know, the mushroom culture is colonizing the grain and the step-to-step -step process uh, that's displayed here. So before we can make spawn, we need, a, we need to start a culture of the mushroom. There are about four ways to start a culture. You can either buy a culture on auger plate or liquid culture online. Uh, the price varies from strain uh, to strain, but generally, typically, it's about five to thirty dollar per strain. You can also obtain a culture by transferring a piece of colonized substrate uh, or from an old spawn bag. So, if you bought a must uh, oyster kit, for example, or a shiitake kit, or or a shiitake spawn. You can always transfer that and get a, get a culture from that as well. If these options are not available, you can always get a culture from spore print or from the internal tissue of a mushroom. So some example, you could buy an aureo plate, you know, liquid culture. Uh, this is uh, spawn. You could retransfer it. Uh, a bag of old, old a bag of a uh, colonized straw. You can get culture for it. Spore print and then internal tissue. To get a culture from spores, first we need to make a spore print from a mushroom. Um, for example, a mushroom with a 4 inch cap can produce 20 billion of spores over the period of 4 to 6 days at a rate of 100 million spores per hour. And consider these impressive number. The wood decay fungus Ganoderma has an estimate to produce spores at a rate of 3, uh, 350,000 per second. It does that for up to six months uh, to a year, uh, producing 5.4 trillion spores, and this will continue for about 10 years or more. So it has been estimated that all the fungi in the world release 50 million tons of spores per year, which may influence weather. Spores are forcibly ejected from the basidia, which is a special terminal right here, separate special terminal uh, cell on the underside of a mushroom cap, and it falls out of the gills. The mechanism is described as a surface tension catapult. So during the discharge, the spores are subject to an acceleration rate of 25,000 G, which is about 10,000 times the acceleration experienced by astronaut during the launch of a space shuttle. These are the white spores of oyster, a yellow oyster mushroom I left on my lab bench. Uh, you can see they completely covered the lab bench within two uh, time frame, about two hours. Uh, and you know, you could see the spores on the tips of the yellow oyster. So they produce a lot of spores. Mushroom produce a lot of spores. Their color varies. And this is a characteristic in the identify, identification of mushroom uh, in, later, in later lecture. Uh, you can also make art out of mushroom spores. Uh, you know, artists usually make different type of uh, mushroom um, mushroom prints, basically. So to make a spore print, you cut the cap off uh, the top of the stalk, which is the stem of the mushroom. Place the excise cap on a white piece of paper or a petri plate and cover the paper or the petri plate with a beaker or a cup or a bowl. 
Uh, this will block the air current from carrying away the buoyant spores. Spores are carried in the air so so well that spores from a culture dish, dish open on the first floor of a building will fall, will fall on to the fourth floor five minutes later. So in five minutes more, they will be falling on the fourth floor in the amount of thousand per square yard. So generally the spore will accumulate in such a large number, they can be seen on your piece of paper with the naked eye within a few hours or less. But to get a thick deposit of spores, wait overnight. Spores can be kept for a long period of time on the dry paper. So to do this, you cut the spore pin out, fold it in half, and store this in an airtight uh, container such as a Ziploc bag in the refrigerator for long, long time storage. So from this cap, I took this cap, put it into a petri dish. You can close the petri dish uh, and, and wait for the spores to discharge. So once you have a spore saved, uh, to get a culture from that, you rehydrate the spores. So you touch the spores with a sterilized implement and transfer this to uh, sterile water. Let the water, let that stand for about six to twelve uh, twelve hour, and plate a drop or two onto suitable auger, like a malt extract auger or potato dextrose auger. It takes about a week for the spores to germinate and obtain a small colony. So let's imagine that you have successfully start a culture of a wild mushroom from those spores. A certain percentage of the spores will will germinate and a culture can be started this way. However, because these are sexual spores, uh, more on this topic next week, uh, genetic hybridization and recombination occur, and the progeny or the offspring may be variable. So this means that the mushroom we produce from spores off of uh, spore print may not look exactly like the parents. In other words, our mushroom may not be like the one we observe in the wire or in our backyard. Um, if the parents are wild and not known, like our example, the progeny could well be very, very variable. In contrast, if the parents are mushroom or domesticated and fruit well, then the progeny can be expected to behave similarly. So like a, a spore print from a culture mushroom bag that you buy, for example. As with wild plants, strain from this wild mushroom would would have to be selectively developed. So by starting a culture from spore of a wild mushroom, you are not confident that the mushroom will grow and will look exactly like the fruiting mushroom that you found. So we can start a culture from the spores of any mushroom that grow on wood chips or compost in this way. We can even do this with mushroom we buy in the store. So a resulting culture would be R alone because there can be no proprietary claim to a culture started from spores since the culture is not a clone. So instead, it's a product of sexual reproduction which result in mixing of genetic material. So you can actually collect spores from any mushroom in the store and then play that out and basically select and breed for your own mushroom and that is your mushroom. Here is what it looks like when you successfully transfer spore onto auger plate. Each individual colony is a result of one spores. You can see right here, as spores right here and that will grow into individual colony. Um, to get this to actually fruit, you have to select, let this grow out and select a section when when the spore, when the different iphy, the anastomosis, when we'll get into this in future lecture. So here on the left, you have what you look at contamination, right? So sometimes there's contaminated room. So, you know, when you make a spore print, you don't have to do this uh, under a HEPA filter. You know, this can be just done on your bench top, right? Sometimes you get contamination here, uh, you know, mites and other things as well. But here, very successful uh, plate, what it looked like. So you see thousands of spores germinating, right? And you want to take some of this section right here and then just basically transfer it in this pattern out here to observe, uh, to obtain basically a single, single colony in the end. So we'll make spawn below 
after we start a culture using a second method, uh, culturing tissue from a fruiting body itself. So we can not legally do this for from a mushroom bot in the store because the resulting culture is a clone and that might be patented by the owner. But since the mushroom we found a while, for example, no one almost certainly can claim ownership. We can start a culture directly from our you know, prize mushroom that we found outside. In mushrooms, sexual reproduction is limited to the basidia. So those are the terminal cells on the gills underneath the cap. All other tissue is vegetatively. This means that if we start a culture from anywhere from the mushroom other than the gills, we are cloning the mushroom. It's like growing potato from tuber. The progeny is all cloned with the tuber or the seed. So we culture, if we culture from a mushroom itself, in this way we are cloning it. And we hope we can produce our mushroom this way. Of course, we have to provide the mushroom with the correct nutrient and environmental condition to have a chance of producing a mushroom like the one we saw. Um, so this is the uh, um, sexual. This is the sexual cycle of a a basidial mycete, which is a mushroom producing fungi. And you can see right here, uh, all these cells are vegetatively, and right here is where sexual rec uh, recombination occur. And this is all where the basidium is. So to culture uh, from tissue, first you want to begin by washing the mushroom, then wipe the cap with ethanol or 10% bleach. Uh, don't forget to basically clean your hand, uh, uh, clean your hand with soap as well. And now you can peel away the mushroom outer layer. So next you could aseptically transfer a small piece of the cap tissue from the center of the cap more or less to a petri uh, plate of malt extract auger. Repeat several times, and after about a week, we notice uh, some small growth on for the piece of tissue. Some plate are contaminated with mold. A few appear to be clean, and we save those. So, basically, fresh mushroom. You can tear the mushroom in half and use a sterile needle. Take a small tissue, transfer it in an auger, and wait till that grow. So, to reiterate again with more picture, first. You know, you clean your hand, then you clean the mushroom, then you flame sterilize uh, your, your tweezers and your scalpels, and you can either pull your uh, mushroom cap uh, with a stock of parts, and using a, a clean tweezer, you can extract a piece from the cap and put it into auger, or you can use a flame sterilized scalpel, cut it, use a tweezer to remove a piece. You can also use uh, the flame sterilized scalpel to remove a piece. Make sure to flame sterilize in between uh, cuttings. So this does not have to be done in the flow hood, the laminar flow hood, or under a HEPA filter. So you can do this directly on in, in any lap bench. Here, this is an oyster mushroom, and you know this is where you want to collect, right? This this tissue right here. The, these are vegetatively tissue that you can easily collect. So you can use a scalpel to remove a piece of uh, the cap. And transfer it that way. So, example. So once you're here, you transfer that into auger plate. Uh, again, more picture to reiterate the, the the transferring of tissue. So finally, you transfer that to auger. Uh, so on the left, right here, you can see that some are contaminated, right? And this is a successful colony. So once you have a successful colony like this, there might be underlying contamination occurring under here that you can't see. So you want to transfer from the hypho tips right here into a new plate. Um, generally, when I do this, I put at least three to four pieces of mushroom tissue onto a plate to basically save plates and wait till that grow out and transfer a, a basically a hypho tip of that onto onto a plate. So the next step is to transfer from our stock plate. So we have several plate representing our stock culture or the master culture. So they are made by basically flaming, uh, flaming uh, a transferred needle or scalpel and cutting a small cube of the tissue uh, with the fungus growing and moving that to a new auger plate such as malt extract, potato extract auger. We do this in front of the HEPA filter because this will be our master plate. So each plate is sealed with a strip of paraffin 
fit a pair of them in these plates or, or clone up or stock plate or the master plate will be stored in the refrigerator and will be and in a clean cabinet somewhere in the house. So always keep the stock culture or the master plate in more than one location so you have one in the cabinet and one in the refrigerator. So to begin the process of producing spawn, now that we have a culture of the fungus, uh, uh, right? So we take that master culture and we transfer that onto a new plate. Wait till that plate colonize, and once this is fully colonized, we prepare our grain. So we use rye grain, the edible grain, not the seed from the turf grass. Uh, wheat turn mushy, while rye grain, often called rye berries, retain their integrity after sterilization. So we we will use one quart wide mouth mason jar, canning jar. Uh, there's nothing special about this size. You know, it's easier to access, easier to clean. So m much larger jar or bags also work. The lid of each canning jar is replaced with a breathable synthetic uh, filter, or you can use cotton plugs, and in your class, out, uh, class handout, I list where you can buy these. Uh, so to sterilize the rye jar, so once you have the sterilized rice jar, uh, they are ready for inoculation. So here you have a sterilized rye jar. You want to work under a HEPA filter, right, or under a flow hood. Get your flame sterilized scalpel, cut pieces of your auger out. Uh, you can definitely cut it much smaller. Uh, I've cut them much, much smaller because each one is an inoculation point. The smaller you cut it, the faster your uh, spawn will be inoculated, basically. And you transfer this into uh, your rye, uh, colonized rice berry. So after a few days at room temperature, the mushrooms should have grown from the, from the each wedges from surrounding the rye berry. Then you take the jar and you stir, uh, distribute the colonized rice berry in a jar by shaking it. So do not hit the jar with your hand. Uh, once glass go under pressure uh, a couple of times, they are very susceptible to breaking, and these glass are very sharp. So never basically hit the jar with your hand. Just sh gently shake it. So after uh, after shaking it, the the rye berry will be basically mixed up and will be loose. Uh, your spawn is ready for use. So. So the jar we just made is a master jar because it was inoculated with a piece of agar from our culture. You want to make more spawn with this master jar. So gather more of jar fitted with synthetic filter, autoclave it with rye berry inside, and once that's finished autoclaving, uh, you're working in the in the HEPA filter or under a laminar flow hood. You pour basically a few tablespoons of colonized rye for your master jar into about ten to 20 new uh, rye berry jar. We label this new jar as G2 for second generation. We might then want to make 10 or 20 new jar or new uh, jars of rye berry with each of the G2 jar. These new jars are called a G3 jars for generation, third generation. Best to stop here if you try another generation, the risk of contamination become unacceptably high, consider this if you make one master jar and 10 jar from that and then 10 jar from each of those you will end up with 100 jar of spawn and from each of those you start 10 bag of mushroom for a total of a thousand bag. What if one master jar was contaminated? All that thousand bags could be contaminated that could be a disaster. So you could see why sterile techniques is critical in spawn production. In large commercial operation, the spawn producing room, the spawn producing room is a clean, is as clean as an operation operating room. Spawn can be stored for weeks or months in refrigerator. So you you see this the step again, right? You, this is your master master jar. You shake that up to loosen it. You transfer it to make G two uh, spawn and then G three spawn. To summarize uh, the steps, basically, you get a you make a culture, you plate out a culture from your master plate, and this is your from your culture collection. You transfer that to uh, sterilized rye berry, let that colonize, and then shake that. And let's say I made two G one right G one uh, uh, spawn jar. Once it's fully colonized, you transfer that to basically G two, and once that's fully colonized. You shake it up and you transfer that each of this 
you transfer to 10 colonized uh, 10 sterile G3 jars to make G3 jars so here's the different stage uh, in spawn maturation along the period of, uh, in incubation starting at zero on the right time zero time right here so this is sterile uh, this is cotton plug basically um, so here zero time to full mature cover with aluminum to protect it from the light here's a recipe to sterilize and make spawn the calcium sulfate is in this recipe is to avoid spawn from getting greasy and allowing the rye berry to flow freely or at least it helps after colonization so you don't want your rye berry to be clumpy right it's hard to transfer that to make g2 and g3 generation spawn now you must sterilize the rye jar so canning jar get basically tire after a number of cycles through a pressure cooker or autoclave so we must be very careful so don't hit the jar so I usually place the jar in a tub with about an inch of water uh, that seems to prevent sharp swinging of temperature that can break the jar sometimes the jar develop a crack near the bottom after a period uh, in the pressure cooker it's hard to see this so when you start working with such jar, the bottom gives way. This causes a mess, but more importantly, the broken edge is extremely sharp and dangerous. There won't be a problem if you keep this in mind and be careful when you handle these jars. The jars must be sterilized in a pressure cooker on autoclave twice for 45 minutes each with a one day interval to allow heat resistant bacterial spores to survive the first autoclaving to germinate. The germina germinated spores will be then will then be susceptible to the second session in the autoclave. There are many different ways to produce spawn. Basically here's some gypsum uh, add grain and water and basically pressure cook this or autoclave this uh, in in uh, in your pressure cooker and always use a f two 45 minute run cycle so there are endless variation to producing spawn some people use sawdust based recipe uh, this is a good choice there is little thermogenesis self heating due to release of heat from colonizing fungus and because it is not as nutritional rich as grain and not many organism can use it it's naturally semi-selective for your mushroom producing fungus which which can readily use it as a substrate in contrast many organisms including common contaminant in the air of your home can utilize cooked grains like rye which makes it non-selective sawdust is initially a little tricky to work with because there's so many so much variation in the type and size of sawdust you're using so the moisture level are kept to the minimal level and allow growth of your fungus. So to prevent the sawdust from knitting together uh, with mycelium as substrate is colonized, rotate the jar uh, or the bags as necessary. Storing sawdust spawn might be challenging too because of the potential of sawdust knitting together. Uh, the risks of potential problem can be acceptable, be small with proper sawdust size and moisture control. Uh, but it might take some trial and error basically uh, this is clumping of sawdust it can be a problem uh, when, when um, basically rye berry grain spawn are put together they produce so much heat because of the fungus growing that inhibit and, and slow down the growth of fungus when it's in contact with other fungus some people use bird seed because it's relatively cheap and may contain millet sorghum as the main ingredient Many grow pre soaked the grain or wash it by running fresh water through it many times. Uh, this is because um, uh, bird seeds oftentimes contain rocks and like you know dirt and other things in that there that's unwanted. So I don't use any of this because I trust the double sterilization process. Uh, so I rarely experience uh, failure. So some growers use a liquid spawn or some variation of this. So here's a common method. Basically, you take an auger plate of your fungus, you macerate it in the blender, 
there's a special small blender that can be sterilized it's all stainless steel um, so you can put it in pressure cooker and sterilize it like any other equipment uh, so you blend up your you macerate up your your auger plate and you pour this into a weak nutritional liquid medium like malt extract uh, minus the auger or you can use uh, potato dextrose minus the auger in just a few days you will see tiny colony each growing from a piece of of the mycelium use this suspension of colony to inoculate jars or bag or sterile grain colonization of the grain will be rapid with this method one could also use this is the suspension of tiny colonies to inoculate straw or sawdust substrate liquid spawn inoculates a greater volume of substrate than grain spawn in a much shorter time but run a greater risk of contamination especially if you use liquid spawn that went through two or three generation great care must be exercised in its production liquid spawn also run the risk of mutation due to huge number of uh, point of source of inoculum. This potential risk is much smaller with sawdust or grain spawn. See right here, this is weekly nutrient medium. You can use basically uh, malt extract uh, diluted or potato dextrose diluted and see individual um, colonies in, 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 in here. So remember spawn can be stored for weeks to months in the refrigerator so you can always prepare them, uh, store them properly or you can buy them and store them properly uh, and then make your mushroom that way. Master culture collection uh, should be checked semi-annually or annually and should be transferred every year. If a very long storage is desired, one proven method is to pour sterilized mineral oil over the mycelium in the culture tube. The culture may remain viable for over 20 years using this technique. Culture collection at major institutions like university or businesses or often store under liquid nitrogen at 300, minus 320 Fahrenheit. So now we're going to start with growing the wine caps mushroom or the King Shrofaria. This is one of the easiest mushroom to grow and it's often grown by homeowner or gardener in the, out, in, the, in the outdoor. Because it grows relatively slowly, it is not high on the list of mushrooms to grow indoor where space may be limiting. And while it can be grown on sawdust in bag, for now we will limit our discussion to cultivation in our backyard. So what, what, what will you need? Basically, you will only need spawn, usually sawdust, spawn, wood chips, water, and rake. That's all you need to, 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 to be successful with this mushroom. Uh, so unless you live in an area where rainfall is dependable, you will need access to water. So the best key to success is keep in mind the number one rule for mushroom cultivation, maintain moisture. Mushrooms require water and humidity to grow and to fruit. So selecting an ideal location can, be, can really reduce your need for moisture management. So the first step is to select and prepare your substrate. You can use wood chips, straw, or both. So Wood chips bed can produce mushroom for several years. Soft hardwood chips, such as box elder, cottonwood, willows, soft maple, magnolia, works best. Hardwood chips, such as oaks, should be left outside to age for several months prior to use. Softwood chips should not be used except in cer cer uh, certain circumstances. Uh, example of softwood tree are cedar, douglas fir, juniper, pine, redwood, spurs. If the wood chips are dry, water them with a sprinkler until wet or soak them prior to proceeding. Straw can be used as a substrate. Straw bed can, be pro can produce mushrooms quicker but have a shorter overall life. So within a year, um, you need to replace the substrate. Clean, weed-free straw of either oats, wheat is best. 
So you want to soak the straw or water the straw until it's uniformly wet. So I, I generally will soak the straw for overnight uh, to hydrate it and condition it uh, and then dry, drain it before proceeding. So a mixture of both straws and wood chip is best if you have both available. So when selecting a bed location, think about moisture maintenance. Shaded areas are the best because bed will be less prone to drying out and require less watering. Full sun bed are possible but require more watering on your behalf. We like to plant in a ready mulch area, under trees or on the shady side of the house or in, uh, in and around ornamental plants. The bed should have soil floor or mulch surface free from weed and so, uh, sod. So right here, side of the house, anywhere where it's shady, side of the house you can do it in a, a metal trout uh, with some with proper drainage, of course. Uh, under the trees, uh, you know, under the garden bed, um, you can cover up the soil with, uh, with a card box first to prevent weeds from growing through before you proceed. For planting the bed, so the bed are created in layers, sandwiching the spawn between layers of substrate. So first you, you know, you place your first layer, which is card box in this case, and then you put wood chips over it, then you sprinkle the, the sawdust spawn onto the wood chip. So once that's sprinkled on, you put the wet hydrated straw or wood chip, whatever you want, on over that, and you inoculate that with more spawn, and you follow that with more straw and more wood chips, uh, so the so you creating alternative layer of straw spawn and wood chip basically. The top layer should always be wood chips. Uh, bed depth depend on the substrate you are using and the location of the bed. Wood chip are less prone to drying out, so uh, bed depth should be about three to five inches. Straw is more prone to drying out, so we recommend five to ten inches. Shaded bed, uh, shade bed can be shallower. Sunny bed should be deeper. Uh, for example, so creating a thick top layer of substrate uh, is crucial because that will protect the spawn underneath from drying out. So it's layering, right? Different layering, uh, different depth. Uh, if you use straw, make sure you pack down the straw. So maintaining and monitoring the bed. So again, think about moisture maintenance. I recommend checking your bed regularly at first. So dig down into the bed with your finger. It should be a little damp, not soaking wet. If it feels dry, then water it with a sprinkler. So a general rule is about one inch of water per week is ideal. But that depends on your bed depth, the sun exposure, and wind. Um, don't, let, don't let the bed dry out because once it's dry out, the fungus basically senesce. Uh, so a well-made bed in an ideal location may need little to no maintenance. While you're digging in the bed, keep an eye out for a white branching thread like my, uh, material we call mycelium, kind of like the root of a mushroom. This is a great sign of successful wine cap growth. See this white mycelial growth? Those are a sign of, of uh, the wine cap growth. So when it's come to harvest time, uh, wine caps are ready to uh, are readily to fruit, typically around four to eleven months after planting. Sometimes they can fruit as short as two months if you use enough inoculum. So the fruiting time varies depending on how much inoculum you use. The more, the faster the mushroom will fruit. Also, with straw, it fruits faster, but then after that, you know, it doesn't have any more nutrient to fruit. So keep an eye on on your bed especially after rainfall or temperature fluctuation that usually trigger the mushroom to fruit you can pick them up when they are young in the button form or you can wait another day or two for the cap to open so simply pluck them from the bed using your hand cut the bottom of the stem off and store the mushroom in the refrigerator until you're ready to eat them bed reju rejuvenation so wine cap mushroom breaks down the bed substrate quickly for this reason straw bed usually only fruit for a single year, wood chips bed may fruit for up to three years, but the production will decline over time. When this begins to happen, you may try to rejuvenate your bed by feeding it new wood chip. So simply add new, add several new inches layer of wood chips 
to the top of your existing bed, ideally in the spring or after a mushroom harvest. Bed uh, rejuvenation is not a guarantee, but with uh, if the wine cap is still vigorous enough, it will begin to colonize the new material and be ready for more fruiting several months later. Consider adding new spawn to the fresh material for a more success appro approach. Thank you, and for the next class, we'll talk about mushroom biology and fungal genetic. So, feature of mushroom, for example, characteristic of a mushroom, producing basidomycetes, mycorrhizal definition, fungal genetic, mating strain, compatibility, and the importance of clamp uh, connection in breeding.